uh, for coming and, and on time. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the National Opera Center. Uh, I'm Laura Lee Everett. I am the Artistic Services Director. And uh, part of our continuing series in um, professional development, we do these Making Connections events where we try to bring in experts in a particular part of the field, not necessarily just the land of singing. And this is our, our first event this year where we wanted to focus on folks from the world of costumes because until something changes, and God knows it could, uh, and we start doing all opera naked, their careers are as essential to creating the product <laughs> as the singers are. So uh, please join me in wel welcoming our panelists for this evening, Mr. David Roberts. <laughs> uh, Ms. Marsha LaBeouf. And Mr. Daniel James Cole. Um, you, I, you'll have, you have your programs and you can read in more depth about all of these fine folks. Uh, but David and Daniel are two um, wonderful, wonderful designers that I've had the pleasure to work with around the industry, um, both in uh, opera companies around the business as well as academic institutions. And Marsha is the costume director for the Washington National Opera and has said many an adventure working both in that shop and working on the operas uh, at the national stage. So uh, to start with, and you can all sort of choose who wants to go first, how did each of you get into costuming, wardrobe, and or design? <laughs> yeah, we'll go that way. Uh, it was an odd path, but I came from a musical family. Um, my parents were both professional musicians, at least at some point in their life. And that led to me having an interest in opera. And then when I was in high school, I started doing the costumes and performing at shows. And when I was in undergraduate school, I double majored in music with a voice major and in theater with a costume design major. And so I was stressed, <laughs> yeah. and I, uh, um, and then ended up going on to do graduate work in costume design. So that's how it happened for me. You started early. Yeah. <laughs> well, I come from family musical influences as well, uh, as well as family fashion influences, I think. I grew up in a singing family. One of my sisters was a professional opera singer, and another one of my sisters was in a high school production of Brigadoon that I saw when I was six. <laughs> it got me into this trade for life, I'm afraid. Uh, but I had five older sisters, so I got to play a lot of dress up when I was a kid. <laughs> so uh, I'm in a profession now that involves dressing up and singing, so it kind of, it's kind of great. And I don't have to do the singing myself, which is even better. Um, I uh, pursued an acting track uh, until I became a freshman in college and couldn't get cast in shows. but found that the people in the costume department liked the fact that I already knew how to sew and was making my own clothes. And uh, as a homesick freshman, I found a new home in the costume department. Um, got two degrees. The first one was in acting and theater, and the second one in costume design. And after freelancing for about five years, I found that the theater jobs and the film jobs were hard to come by, but the opera jobs sort of just came to me. I have no idea why that happened, and it's, it's an important part of my tale to tell because sometimes the path to your success is very serendipitous, and you don't know where it's going to come from. But I thought if all these people liked me, it might be a good thing to stick with. <laughs> Well, I did not come from a particularly musical family, although my father played the bagpipes. Does that count? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <For something> like <coughs> <laughs> but um, when I was a little tyke, um, and when, I, when other little kids wanted to be firemen and, and cowboys, I, I, and people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said I wanted to be an animator at the Walt Disney Studios. <laughs> And then, um, then later I decided, I think, that I wanted to illustrate children's books. And then when I was in junior high school, I'd sort of discovered musical theater and then get, well, turned into a big old theater queen. But, um, <laughs> um, but I had always liked classical music. In fact, 
again, when I was a little kitty wink before I even went to school, I think we had these little yellow plastic records. That, um, there were 78s, and my two favorite ones were Mozart's Turkish Rondo and Dance of the Little Swans from Swan Lake. <laughs> so I guess I was musically precocious, even as a three-year-old or whatever. Um, and then when I was probably about 12, I got a Gilbert and Sullivan for Kitties record for Christmas, and I liked that. And then soon I was listening to Carmen and La Boheme, and by the time I was in college, I was a full-fledged opera queen. So, um, and then um, the gentleman who gave me my first job in New York was offered the job running the costume department at the Metropolitan Opera in 1976, and he made it a condition that he could bring, quote, his assistant, because he knew that I knew all the plots of all the operas <laughs> and, and what that would require in terms of, of costumes. And uh, so I went and I worked there with him for three seasons and was an uncredited assistant designer for two productions, Eugene Onegin and Don Carlo. Um, they've both been replaced, unfortunately, but they were lovely productions. Um, and then I worked for uh, 10 seasons or more as, as assistant to Zach Brown, who was a resident designer at Washington National Opera, and um, occasionally getting a gig of my own every once in a while. And then in 1980 or 81, I went freelance. And my first freelance job was a Faust for Sarah Caldwell in the Boston, Opera Company in Boston. And because I always liked opera, it just seemed that most of my jobs wound up being in opera. Yeah. What, um, in going into opera, um, study-wise, you studied theater in school, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so all of you actually, the, the study path was theatrical as well as, as musical and costumes, but then going into opera. What makes designing for opera or working in opera different than theater or film from a designer and or a wardrobe standpoint? Um, I can start off with that. I think most importantly, the scale is typically, not always, but typically in a much bigger space. Um, usually theater doesn't end up being in that big of a space unless it's a national tour and you're performing in the you know, civic Um, also, in opera, you you have body types sometimes that are not necessarily perfect for the character because the people are cast, most often, they're cast for their voice and not for the way they look. Now, that is becoming, looks are becoming more and more important, but the bottom line is they still have to be able to sing the part. Right. So you frequently, like for instance, I remember dressing a 48-year-old Barbara Daniels, who was a size 14 at the time, and passing her off as a 16-year-old geisha girl. <laughs> um, and this is an exercise that one has to do. Japanese. Um, Japanese, no yeah. less, yes. Mm. So, um, and uh, also I think when you're costuming for opera, I believe might be touching on this later, mm -hmm. but you have to take into account that there's music involved and your clothing has to go along with that content we can discuss because the movement would be true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say that's, for, for me, that's like one of the most important differences is that the music adds a, a whole other dimension and it, I feel that it should lead you in a certain direction. Um, maybe even your, your color palette. Um, let's take, for example, two operas that both take place in Spain, uh, Barbara of Seville mm -hmm. and Don Carlo. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, musically, it, it, it tells you, I mean, I don't know, I, there are certain designers who would probably take issue with this, but for me, Barbara of Seville should be extremely colorful and it should be, there should be a lot of orange and yellow and red and big polka dots and scallopy things and Don Carlo should be black and more black and maybe a little bit of charcoal gray or some really dark brown and it should all be kind of angular and um, mm -hmm. 
And that, that comes from the music, not necessarily from the libretto. Right. Or, well, okay, here's two comic operas that both take, Spain, take, in, take place in Spain, comic operas, and that would be Barbara Seville and Marriage of Figaro. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, I don't think the Marriage of Figaro would necessarily use the same color palette or as broad a kind of style as, um, as Barbara Siddle because it's not as farcical. There's more. It's not as farcical, and it's much. Figaro is, has a much sadder and more serious. Yeah, yeah undertone. and serious. Yeah, there is a serious side to it. It actually and involves. And it's the they people are the more same real. Family, but oh, sorry. <laughs> That's not either of those operas, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. The first, the Barber of Seville, is absolute strict, straight comedy, and the Marriage of Figaro, it's a, it's about how this couple gets together. And Figaro is a few years later, and the marriage is kind of not such a happy one, and w and you get to see it from the point of view of the wife who's not happy at all. But it's the music and too. The mu it's not just the situation. It's the actual music that tells you. And the music the, tells you all yeah, of that, yes. Yeah. And, and it informs how you would design it, for sure. Do you feel like when you see certain, certain shows that, that designers have tackled with a, a concept in mind, that they've come up with the, with the director, that it flies in the face of what you're hearing it musically to tell you in oh, terms yeah. of palette and style? Yeah. That's a very yeah. difficult path to trod. Yeah. I think frequently it flies in the face of the opera itself, too. But I, you know, I think that one thing that happens in this industry in order to do something innovative is that we sometimes end up with concept for concept sake, mm -hmm. which isn't always necessarily a good thing, it's just a thing. Right. And, and right. I think there are directors who are not necessarily sensitive to the score. They're sensitive to the libretto, but not to the score. And I personally know designers who don't really care for opera as an art form, and yet they work in opera. Hmm. So. Since we were kind of already on subject of music, I'm going yeah. to tell a story about a designer. And I'm not going to name who this designer was, but you can probably figure it out okay. if you look through some archives. She was speaking at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and she was known as a fashion designer from Britain, and as a fashion designer who I love very dearly. But she was designing a production at New York City Opera that was actually a remount of something she'd done before. And it was very complicated. <laughs> it, yeah. Sorry, they all know each other if you didn't figure that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I know who this and, is. And uh, during the Q&A after her presentation of all of her sketches and her photographs from the earlier productions, um, I raised my hand and I said, at what point did listening to the music come into your design process? And she responded to my question by saying, I didn't bother to listen to the music. I figured I'd hear it plenty of times during dress rehearsals. Well, wow. I also saw an Aida, pictures of an Aida designed by this same designer down in a house in Australia where, uh, <laughs> where um, again, I looked, I saw videotape of it, I looked at costumes, and it was. Like, totally unmusical. It had nothing to do with the score of Aida, even the plot of Aida. It was like saturated colors in space. And, and, you know, so I, I, this is a situation where I think sometimes our industry latches on to certain big name designers like David Hockney's productions like his Tristan and Isolde, who had absolutely nothing to do with Wagner's music whatsoever, but the management latched onto it because it was a famous person. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really, maybe it does sell tickets, and so more power to it, but it's to the detriment of the art form, and it's definitely to the detriment of the individual piece. I know ever so many more jokes, thank you, yes. Ever so many more jokes in the universe about that particular Tristan and Isolde. Mm -hmm. Um, where it, one of the things, and I will, we will talk about this because Daniel started to touch on it, is the idea that singers, opera singers are not the, they, they are not necessarily the size you think that a character who is playing a 15 year old girl 
in you know ancient Egypt who's dancing for her stepfather so she can have the head of John the Baptist served to her. But unfortunately, the voice type that Strauss wrote that for, most people don't achieve until their 40s. So there are challenges that you face with that. But the other thing is that Wagnerian repertoire is traditionally not sung by people who are small and petite or necessarily agile. And that particular Hockney production was built for the Billy Goat's Gruff. Billy Goat's Gruff is the steepest rake I've ever seen in my life for the stage. And the Tristan and Isolde are both 250 to 300 pound singers who are having to try to amble romantically up and down this rake, um, which there have been many jokes about, you know, rehearsal things that were said to each other. And in fact, at one point, the uh, soprano broke her ankle um, working on that set. So, you know, it's, it's, that is one of those productions that I do. I think that there was an idea that the, having a, a big name designer like David, Ho artist like David Hockney design it was great in theory. Um, but not as effective or useful in execution. This so was not a fun show to watch. I think opera companies reach out beyond traditional theater designers to fashion designers, to sculptors and people from the fine arts because the repertoire of opera, it, it, gets, it, does, it does get repeated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of these uh, pieces have been around for hundreds of years. And they have the loftiest goals. They, they do want to, at some point, tell the musical story that the composer originally wanted you to do. But they, they have commitments to audiences who maybe saw the production that they own four times and want to see something different. And they want to change it up. And they feel like they're making their mark. So if you are the one chosen to design one of these things and you're not traditionally theatrically trained, I think it's a huge responsibility that's maybe placed in hands that have no, no concept of, of, the, of the weight of that. Yes, the Hockney flute was controversial, but it went all over the place and it was very successful and it's kind of iconic now. Think what you may of it. San Francisco just did another iconic magic flute with a sculptor, um, uh, um, from Nebraska named Yun Kaneko. Yes. Again, <laughs> the images are great. I could pull out any one of those costumes and put them together and say, oh, wouldn't that make a good pair of salt shakers to sell in the gift shop? <laughs> <laughs> but the effect, it's true. the effect on stage was none of the mysticism and mystery that the music uh, that Mozart wrote for Magic Flute a whimsy. Just la our whimsy lays right out for you there. Well, mm. the whimsy was there. They would make cute salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> That's but, right. <laughs> but you know, I, it just there was I no mean, flute, flute is such a difficult piece because it, there are so many different levels that you have to take into consideration when you do flute because there's the, the 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 sort of symbolic part, and then there's the sort of cute little papagano part, and then there's the spooky part, and you have to somehow make that all make some kind of visual sense. Mm -hmm. I think it's a toughie. It I've is. never had to design it, but it yeah. would be a challenge. There are a lot of things about that show that are, that are a challenge. But before we get away from the working with designers from outside the field, um, I know that Marsha and David shared, had a shared experience several many moons ago um, with Rudolph Valentino. Um, uh, the, there was a, and talk a little bit will, as well about the fact that that was a new work because um, I know that all of you have had experience not just with the quintessential pieces like Flute and Carmen and Tristan well, and Isolde, but new opera that's, that's brand new. I'm going to presume that some of you here don't have a background in opera and don't know that, uh, no, don't know all the stories and maybe also don't, don't have a background in silent movies. Well. Um, we did an opera, a, a world premiere of an opera called The Dream of Valentino a few years ago. Um, <laughs> 1994? It was about the silent movie star Rudolph Valentino and um, somehow it was decided that fashion designer Valentino would design the clothes. Well, Mr. Valentino was available to do some of the clothes. 22. 22 of the... Of the what are oh, I did 180 or so. 
eight or something, something like that. Like it's an that, insane yeah. catastrophe. Or I, I think there was some added. That, I, that was my last And count, David was given the thankless task at times of essentially being a shadow designer, such as, such as the uh, experience of, of working with famous, famous names sometimes. All the work and none of the work. And he ain't got all the budget, too. Right. <laughs> For his for the 22. 22. That's I, right. I was trying to figure it out. I think I had about $25 a per costume to costume 188 characters. Yeah. And then there were different, then he had come up with these different schemes for each scene. So there was a scheme that was black and white stripes, and there was one that was black and silver, and there was one that was pink, mm -hmm. and there was one that was sort of peacock tail colors, um, which I, we did with, uh, well, I bought, I bought a lot of things at the $10 stores. <laughs> and I had costume, to do shoes and everything. As the costume coordinator for, for that show, as a, a, which, was, which was a world premiere for my company, I was very grateful that David had to design the bulk of the costumes instead of having it be the other way around because I had a trained theater costumer organizing the bulk of the, a bulk of the design for that show. And so then every once in a great. while during dress rehearsal, I would have to call up Rome. I, I had made two trips to Rome to consult with him. Um, he never met with the director who was a Swedish woman. I was sent to Stockholm to meet with her, and then directly I went from Stockholm directly to Rome to report to Mr. Valentino what she wanted. Then I had to go back two weeks later to approve his sketches. Oh boy, that was a corker. <laughs> We're sitting at this big square table. I was on one side, and he and his suite, I believe it would be called, were seated on two sides opposite me, and he presented me with all the sketches. And they were pretty good, I have to say. Um, they were stage worthy, um, because one of the differences I think that, that a lot of um, fashion designers, they're used to designing on a, on a dress form that's like a hand's reach away. Mm -hmm. And you know, they don't think in terms of nobody's going to be closer to this than like 30 feet, and that's the conductor. Right. Um, Everything so, is going to be and, at 40 uh, feet in dim lighting at best. Yeah. Um, but he had a pretty good sense of that. So th that was fine. The only thing, there was one character who was supposed to be a kind of a businesswoman and not a clothes horse. And I took a deep breath, and then I said that I thought maybe that, that, that her stuff was a little over-designed. And everybody jumped on me, except Mr. Valentino, who said, no, 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 let him speak. So I explained that the director thought that this woman should be dressed in rather business-like kind of clothing, and that most of these things were a little too fancy. And he said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, well, this sketch seems, seems nice. Maybe if you did something like this in gray and, and one in black and one in off-white or beige <laughs> or something. And he said, well, why don't we just beige. use that same sketch and make three different outfits? And I said, well, that would work great. And, and he was, it ended he up was, being a unifying yeah. concept for the entire And he was thing. actually very nice. Because and, she was and, sort uh, of the narrator of the piece. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. it, it actually worked great. It worked great. But then there were, then things showed up that was like sleeveless. And we had a pretty good looking cast, um, as, as opera singers go. They were <laughs> on the slim side. <laughs> But, but there was still a lot of, you know, this going on, like when they would be dancing, and I'd have to call Rome and say, mm, I think it needs sleeves, or I think it needs like, some kind of a scarf Add or some something. Fringe. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, but anyway, it all it all, it all worked it out was in the fine. end. Well, yeah. you, you will hear any any time you talk about costuming for opera, that's the cliche that comes up that that you're you're having to design something from someone's wonderful imagination for a body that is all too real. And one thing I found really interesting about that process, um, Valentino designed those 22 costumes and they were built in Italy at a theatrical costume house, mind you, that does a lot of costumes for a lot of movies that you've all have seen, a costume house called Tirelli. Um, 
We sent measurements to Tirelli and said, these are the sizes to make these costumes for. And the costumes came back and they were to a costume too small. Because I, I, I think somehow Valentino's people had looked and said, oh, they can't possibly be that big. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, they could, yes. actually. And in addition, they have to move in these things. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, um, which we had started to touch on before. Um, and, I, and also, if you all would sort of address, um, what's the, the, the hierarchy in your, in your standard opera costume shop? Who are all the people, because you were referring to, to David as a, an associate designer, um, and then you know, your title is relatively unique, but there's always someone who is actually really running the shop. Um, so how, how does that structurally well, play out? It depends what, what type of costume department you're talking about. I mean, there are, like, like in theaters, there are big theaters and small theaters. Uh, my company has a fairly good sized costume department. Uh, we've been bigger, uh, but uh, generally there is someone who runs the work, the work room. Uh, that's either a costume shop manager. In my case, um, I'm a senior member of the staff. I've been at Washington National Opera for 24 years, so a while back they gave me the lofty title of costume director. That basically means I get to go to a few extra meetings and have more responsibility when it comes to cutting the budget, <laughs> but the, that's an, another story. The, the hierarchy in a costume department, the people who are actually making or processing the costumes, there will be someone who manages, helps, helps the teams manages, manage the workload. The teams, you say? Yes, there is someone who is a depending on what part of the country you're in, might be called a draper, might be called a, a cutter, uh, but is basically the person responsible for making the patterns. That person is also going to be responsible for fitting the clothes on the body and then correcting the patterns. They usually have an assistant called a first hand, and uh, the first hand uh, takes the patterns from the draper and actually lays them out on fabric, adds the seam allowance, and um, sometimes with the, with the collaboration of the draper, fitter, cutter, <laughs> uh, hands off the work to a team of stitchers, who could be called seamstresses, but I usually call them stitchers because we have men and women stitching in our department. Uh, there are other components. There can be milliners. There, um, most Costume departments, I think, in this country don't have the luxury of having someone who only does millinery or who only does jewelry making or accessories and who only does shoes. Uh, all of those components you will find in European costume departments at all of the major and some of the mid-range opera houses, I think. Um, the people who do what, what I, in my department we call crafts, which I think is a really silly name <laughs> for some amazing work, they, they are the true artisans, I think, in many cases. They have to know millinery. They have to know jewelry making. They have to know how to make a pair of shoes you just picked up at Nine West look like an 18th century pair of Madame Pompadour shoes. Um, make sword belts. Um, masks. Masks, de decorate masks. Um, we had to buy a small vacuum form machine last year to make masks for a, a whole chorus of oracles in Nabucco. So they had to learn how to work a vacuum form machine. Um, there is a person, um, the best title I ever I heard for this is called fabric modification artist. <laughs> That's somebody who knows their way around a can of ripped dye. Um, and lots of other things too. It's not just dyeing fabric, it's treating fabric to make it look distressed or dirty or oily or silk screening uh, you know, a visual effect onto it, uh, all, all sorts of things like that. I'm really squeezing this. Now those are all the hands-on people, the people who are making and fitting and finishing the costumes. There's a whole organizational component and that's where I come in. As costume director, I am an administrator. Um, when I got into this business, I started out wanting to be an actress, okay? I, I, was okay? I was a good student and I was okay in math, but I didn't take any business courses. I certainly didn't take any management courses, and it's all I do. I'm responsible for you know, personnel decisions. I have a whole parcel of evaluations that I have due last week, um, <laughs> right now. Uh, we hand, we, we, 
deal with interpersonal relationships between our staffs. We are responsible for exhorting them to get, get things done on budget, on time, all of those things. I have people who are responsible for the entire coordinating effort. Daniel said that the scale of opera is big. Well, the scale and size of it is big. A, a, a stage play might have 25 characters in it. A 25 costume opera is what I consider a tiny opera. The average opera will have anywhere from 100 to 150 costumes in it. The Nabucco did, we did last year came in at about 257. That was brand new costumes that all came through my shop. So there's an organizational component. Uh, I like call them coordinators. Again, on the West Coast, they're more referred to as supervisors. They're line producers. They're people who coordinate the fittings, make sure all the purchasing gets done on time. It's a very different system from the New York system of getting a show designed where the designer is really responsible for in a way putting a shop together and getting all those small components. It, it never ceases to amaze me that these big Broadway shows get done in 25 different little shops. That, that, that's so Sometimes much work. Sometimes when you do opera in New York City there, outside of that or city opera, mm -hmm. we have to work in that. Place. How many so, shops yeah. did you use for um, Ghosts of Versailles? Like three. Yeah. yeah. So Daniel, explain well, the difference. But then you had all those rental places yeah, too. Exactly. So the, for, for, for somebody who doesn't have a shop that is an in-house shop at a single opera company. My last production was the Ghosts of Versailles at Manhattan School of Music, where I worked frequently. It was the first New York performance since it was at the Met at the in, I think, in 1995. Right. It was mm -hmm. their last performance of it, so there's lots of attention on it. And that show had approximately 150 costumes. I was too scared to actually count them. <laughs> But, and the but, scope of them, I mean, it's yes. from so many different, different periods. And yeah. it was, the, the budget was large for their standards, but still to create that show. I think we built two costumes and the other 148 came from three different rental companies and were altered all over the city. This is the story of opera. Most times, and I tell this to all the young singers I talk to, most of the costumes you wear in your career are going to have been made for someone else. Opera is expensive. Um, I've had diva costumes made here in New York that cost upwards of $20,000 just for one costume. You're not going to do this for 150 costumes. That's why the principal costumes may get designed and built, but the chorus is probably going to come from somewhere else. Um, it's, it's just a sort of a fact of, of opera production life. And the thing about it is, though, it doesn't matter where it comes from. There's a designer coordinating everything and make it look like that unique product, make it look like it belongs in that unique production. And there is a, a group of people customizing each costume to the artist so that when the audience sees the show, they really do see a new show, even though the components may have existed in another entity. I saw that show Daniel did, and it, I mean, you would never have known that it came from all those different places. It all went together beautifully. You weren't aware of what was new and what wasn't new. And there was a group, the ghosts were one group, and then there were the, the revolutionary people were one group, and everything worked so well within each little group. It was, it was it's wonderful. It's trendy. Mm -hmm. We're great recyclers. <laughs> <laughs> what do you wish someone had told you before you worked on your first opera? <laughs> Yeah, everything just kind of progressed from there, you know, so. There was nothing, there, there was, was nothing scary. There was nothing scary. It just <laughs> seemed it was already in a comfort zone. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't think of anything at first, but one just popped into my head. You, you are dealing with a lot of kind of neurotic personalities. Not all of them, <laughs> but, but every once in a while you get somebody, because they are odd shapes once in a while, they're very insecure. And sometimes they've figured out in their head what they think works best for them, and sometimes they're so wrong. 
and, and you have to fight with them to make them feel, well not fight with them, you have to make them feel that you are making the right decisions and, and make them feel secure with your decisions, that, you, that your name is on the line. You're gonna look like a fool if they go out there and look like an ox. Mm -hmm. So you have to convince them that it's in your best interest to make them look good as well as their best interest. And sometimes you have to fight against these preconceived notions that they have. I had a little girl, tiny little thing, and she had kind of a big nose, and she wore bangs down to, just about to her nostrils. <laughs> and and I, I said, we're gonna, have a, we're gonna have a big fight about this, because I'm not gonna let you wear bangs. And I said, the thing is, you've got such beautiful eyes. You look like Maria Callas, who also had a big nose, by the way. Mm -hmm. I said, you've got these striking eyes, and when you wear your bangs down, halfway down your face, nobody can see your eyes. And there happened to be a super lady in the dressing room one night, and she said, he's right, you're right. You look beautiful with your hair back. And I would go, kiss that woman. <laughs> and you know, she started wearing her hair back in, when she wasn't on stage after that point. And I mean, I was like, wow, I won that one. But, <laughs> but sometimes it's a real struggle. What's, what are the, the stories that require cocktails aside. What what are the what's the single biggest design challenge challenge you have had to solve, and or the sing, single biggest artist challenge, you have had to overcome. Can you name names? <laughs> we, we can just we can just name we can just name voice types. I, I you know we we started to touch on this earlier. I'll let you guys ruminate on that for a second. The idea that when you're designing for singers, that because they move and they breathe, yeah. that there are some specific design aspects that you have to take into account that, not that actors don't move and breathe as well, but um, I know we've talked, uh, all of us at different times, about how much certain parts of the body change when a singer breathes in. Example, I won't give her a name, but I'll give you a hint. She's an American mezzo-soprano, and your nickname is Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> When she, when she takes a breath, her back expands, her back across the back expands eight inches. Wow. Yeah. So what do you do, use elastic? Yeah, or put in, or yeah, you can possible. put in panels of elastic or, or yeah, yeah. Or mm -hmm. something. But you don't, that's not where you expect people to expand across the back. You know? It's funny. It, it, it depends on the singer. Oh, and remember that Japanese woman whose throat expanded like a frog? <laughs> <laughs> no, she. Because I've never heard of anybody's throat expanding, and she she showed one. us in the fitting room. She said, and she said, watch, and and it went. She looked like like the one, one of those. Done the Mimi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was also a person, and I was I was starting to say, I've also seen a singer like Ruth Ann Swenson sing as powerfully as Marilyn Horn. I'm sorry, I'm gonna drop that name. We're <laughs> gonna out her. And when so tightly corseted, you didn't even know how she could breathe, much less hit a note and, and have power and volume to reach the back of a 4,000 seat opera house. It really depends on the person. But the singer that you're talking about, I mean, I'll get people who wanna be tightly corseted and I'll get people like this lady who could not stand to have anything around her waist. Yeah. So much so that her skirt was so loose, we had to put suspenders on it. <laughs> she wouldn't wear an, a bra or any kind of undergarment, so we actually had to make her a camisole with ruffles on the outside of it, underneath her blouse, so it looked like she had curves. No pantyhose, we had to give her stockings to wear. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I've never heard of such a thing. It, yeah, and but that's it just unusual. depends on a, a singer and what they need. Yeah. And, Singers, I think, get a little more, get hurt a little more because of the fact that they're athletes. They are singing, they are, are what it takes to breathe and sing, what it, the focus that it takes to watch the maestro conducting and, and, and take his cues to blend your voice with your, with your, co your, your, your co-workers, the other singers. Mm -hmm to not get stepped on by the 50 chorus people who are milling around behind you, also singing at the top of their lungs, to be heard over this orchestra. It just takes a lot. So we tend to give in to these 
proclivities, you know, these, 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 these little requests that they make. Um, there does come a time, though, when you have to stand your ground. And usually, if, if the aria is not at stake, if the moment is not so important, the singer will also have to give. I mean, I, I use, a, it's a bad example, but uh, in The Magic Flute, there is a character called Papagena, and she does get a lovely duet at the end of the opera, but she spends most of the opera in disguise as an old hag. And you can do whatever you want to her as the old hag, <laughs> because she doesn't have to sing anything. She has to talk like this. Um, <laughs> but you can, you can have artistic license all you want for a situation like that, but if you've got a soprano singing Puccini, you have to listen to, to you have to at least listen to them. I, um, I think we get a reputation in opera sometimes for kowtowing to whatever the divas want. And divas get a bad reputation for being difficult. They're not, they aren't all difficult, although that does make for better stories. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to um, say. <laughs> it's not our responsibility as designers or costumers, I think, to tell these people what they want to hear to make them look the way they think they should look, like David's ex example was a perfect one. Um, it's our responsibility, and I think the responsibility of all designers to at least listen. And if a singer is smart, I mean, you, know, you, you talk about challenges that, that drive you crazy. One that drives me crazy is when a singer won't in turn listen, have an open mind when they walk into a fitting. There's this, this real clash of, of information and, and character that happens when a singer walks into the fitting room and sees the costume they're going to wear for the first time. Um, if you've played it right, they've had a conversation with the director, they've seen a sketch or they've seen a photograph of the costume or something like that. Someone's explained to them why they are being asked to wear this. You don't have to like it, but I do think we owe it to you to, to, to let you know why, you know? Mm. And, you know, we always fall back on, you know, we're not asking you to like it, we're paying you to wear it. That's right. But, um, that's, another, that's another story. Um, it, it's, it's just important that everybody in that situation be informed about the needs of each other and make sure that at the end of it, what you're serving are the needs of the opera. Yeah. Well, and sometimes one thing I found that singers, when they make requests from us, they don't, even though they've been working in opera for, long, for a long time, very, very, very few of them have any knowledge of fashion history or what might be appropriate right. in a certain time period. And their requests usually come from a vocabulary of contemporary fashion, even though you're doing something set in the 1850s, for instance. I remember once, um, he wouldn't care if I told the story because he's so sweet. But I was costuming Marcello Giordani mm -hmm. as Pinkerton in Madame Butterfly, which is a white naval U.S. uniform from the Spanish American War. And um, he wanted the pants to have a deep braid because that's what his Armani pants did. <laughs> and that had the Lula Armani. Channel, you know, but, uh, <laughs> and we were able to talk him out of it. But <laughs> That's fantastic. He's like the nicest singer in the yes. entire world. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, I just kind of like let it roll off my back and think, this is really funny. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. what happens if they have that kind of a break, Marcello. Yeah. You're going to split your pants. <laughs> um, I, when I worked at the, at the Met, I, there were many, many times where we had to deal, deal with divas. There was a soprano from Spain who was very famous for her pianissimi. Um, <laughs> she, was a, she was a large lady. MC. Yeah, mm -hmm. MC. Yeah, MC. She was a large lady. And uh, we were costuming her in an 18th century um, opera where they wear the big hoops that are sort of oval and big on each side. And no, no, but she said to us, and this, this refers to what Daniel's saying about not knowing about costume history. She said, oh, she prefaced every gripe that she had, and she had quite a few, with, I'm sorry. And this particular one was, I'm sorry, but this wrong shape, this is 
Ad, um, uh, Manuel Escaut should be Rosenkavalier. <laughs> <laughs> so that was her knowledge of period costumes, is that, uh, naming it some other opera. Well, we weren't doing either one of those operas. We were doing Adriana Le Couvreur, so what difference does it make? <laughs> but, um, Which is a different They're all different 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 your span of each other's same anyway. Same yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but her best gripe was, I'm sorry, but I know can sing in this color. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, Marsha and I were, Marcia was mentioning this problem earlier. There's, there are several, um, as there are in all theater, there are several fantastic opera superstitions. And um, we are not necessarily privy to all of them here in the States. The, there are several of them that are based in some historic significance that come from Europe. And I have been in situations working with European singers who will look at you, and if I were to walk in in a shirt the color of mine or Daniel's, um, I have had a soprano throw me. Actually, she threw a dresser out first for wearing a purple shirt. Um, <laughs> there is a great suspicion, in particular from Italian artists, that purple is bad luck to be anywhere near the stage if you are doing Italian repertoire. Now, there's a basis for that, which grows out of the fact that, at, uh, um, Daniel probably knows which dates, but at, at a, a point in time much earlier in history when the church had more governance over the theater, and they decided that the theater was um, distasteful and blasphemous in the face of God, during Lent, come on in, uh, during Lent, they would hang purple draping over the theater doors and close the theaters. So for 40 days, these people who made their living on the stage were broke because theater couldn't happen. And that was what well, a friend of mine who was actually a theater director in Italy said, well, that's why it's bad luck to wear purple backstage around the artists during a show. Um, there is also some wild and fantastical superstition that has to do with peacock feathers. Yeah, but the, she had already thrown her dresser out of the dressing room for wearing a purple shirt. And I came in and I happened to be wearing a dark purple shirt and she looked at me. She was like, hello, hello, what are you doing? I was like, no, 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 it's, it's indigo. It's not really purple. Um, and convinced her to not throw me out of the dressing room or not come in from my side of the stage. Uh, as the stage manager. So, you know, there's those, you can use the power of persuasion. <laughs> it it wasn't purple that MC couldn't sing in, by the way. Oh. <laughs> it was a different <laughs> color. It was a kind of a bronze color. It was beautiful. It was several layers of iridescent fabrics and it, it, was, it kind of was a golden bronze, coppery. Nice. She thought yeah. it was brown, I think. Oh. Yeah. She didn't like it. Yeah, she didn't like it. <laughs> that was the bottom line. She didn't like it. Um, I want to give everybody in the room the opportunity to ask some questions too, um, and we wrote way more questions than we would ever have the time to get through this evening. But um, uh, if there was one other one we wanted to answer, do you have a preference? I, I know I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit about um, about if a young designer or craftsperson is looking to break into the world of opera, where do you start? But you can pick a different question if you want to answer. Is that the question? Well, I, I would on love to table? hear. That's the question that's on the table, and then you know we should well, ask these nice folks question. what they want to ask. If you, if you are a young designer or craftsperson looking to break into this world, where do you start? Well, I think for a craftsperson or a draper or a stitch or somebody like that, mm -hmm. you just start working, right? You intern someplace like Chautauqua Opera or and then that can lead to a stitching job at another company and you mm -hmm. can keep working on that for a few years. Um, I think that as a designer, the best thing to do is, one, learn the repertoire. There's so many designers who don't know squat about the repertoire. Actually, there's a lot of directors who don't know. But that's, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a separate making connections. I think it's important for a designer to know that even if they don't know opera, Go and don't like opera. Go out and buy opera for dummies and read the plots. Just get a general sense of what the art form is about. Mm -hmm. Because I will tell you the fact that I was a singer in undergraduate school has given me so much more insight into the fact that the bulk of my career as a costume designer has been operatic. Um, 
And I think that they need to start interning for established designers. And uh, hopefully that will lead to paid positions. I have an intern, uh, someone who was an intern for me um, on a Ben School music show a few years ago. She was a former student. And then uh, she went on to, um, before he passed away, she assisted Marty Paquinas for like a year and a half. And she was just my second assistant on Ghost of Versailles at Manhattan School of Music. And she started as an intern with me, mm -hmm. what, three, four years ago. So that's a pretty quick trajectory. Yeah, yeah, that is. And as far as some of the internships and or the summer job positions uh, that are available, we actually have um, reference on our website that goes through the, uh, the listings that are available with the different companies that are out there. You can also call and talk to us in Artistic Services. I know there are various companies that go and we're gonna try to help them list the job postings that they have at USITT, um, where they actually go and advertise those jobs, which is more, I think a lot of that is for people who want experience working in the shops and, and doing all of that, but the idea of finding a designer that you can intern with or assist um, I think is, is a great resource and we should help facilitate that. Other thoughts along that question? Anybody? I'd kind of like to hear. You want to hear? What other questions do you have? What other questions do you all have? Anyone? Yes. Well, I'm, um, I'm a singer actually and I just, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> and um, I just enjoy that, this whole side. I really don't know that much about it. But I was wondering um, if, when doing our research as singers uh, into our characters, kind of getting an idea of, of the time period and the costumes, I mean, that's very important for me for kind of setting up this, the world. So um, I was wondering if you had any suggestions of resources that you use as designers um, when you do your research and coming up. I guess I'm thinking more historical. Yeah, of course, nowadays, everything's set in the 50s, regardless of when it's supposed <laughs> to take place. That's right. That's but, right. Um, it's very popular right now. But you can get, um, just like, you know, go to the, one of the few remaining bookstores that's not online, you know, like Barnes & Noble's on Union Square or something. There's, there's a section, you know, on fashion and everything. And just browse, and you can find very inexpensive paperback kind of, um, there's one by, uh, He's been dead for a long time, but his name is James Labor. He was an English man, and it's uh, all illustrated. The things you want to avoid are the ones that are redrawn by somebody. There's a man named John Peacock who does these horrible books. I would love to see him burned on a pile of his own <laughs> horrible books. I they're, agree with that. Ugh, they're horribly redrawn but with the proportions all David, cockeyed. I, I, think, I think from a singer's perspective, they're just looking for a basic resource. And I'm, uh, uh, this gentleman right now. here. Yes, exactly. In a yeah. year, yeah. anything from yeah. 1850 in to 2010, year, there's going to be something written on it. But so that's I recommend very you commendable. Yeah, like what James 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 yeah, the James Labor. James Labor book is good. Right. Is but that's so commendable. And yeah, actually, asking that is great. I once designed a La Rangine that was double cast, and one of the sopranos absolutely saturated herself in turn of the century period art about dance halls and the designers I was basing the costumes on, and the other one had absolutely no interest in it. Yeah. Guess which one gave more dynamic performance? Okay, that's right. a, a no-brainer. But I think just the fact that you're interested, honestly, the Wikipedia yeah, articles on say. fashion yeah. history are, yeah. they're not great, but they're okay. Yeah, they're great. And they and include some the good visuals. For, for yeah. that kind of yeah. That you can, you know, drag and drop onto your desk. You can teach yourself What's one role in History yeah. of Western yeah. Fashion by Century. Yeah. And, and Wikipedia. Um, there, let's see, there's a book by uh, Michael and Ariana Batterberry called Fashion in this, the Mirror of History that you can frequently find in, in used bookstores inside of print. But um, that's a really good place to start. And if you're doing the 18th or the 19th century, there's volumes and volumes and volumes of great individual books that treat those time periods. 
do you usually go for um, journals and magazines of the time period too to kind of see what if it's 20th century on, yeah it depends on when they're it's available mm -hmm. and um, you can now find the London Times online going back to like 1805 yeah you, the New York Times goes back to 1800 yeah I did a cozy well, we both done cozy set in the for, during the First World War. Mine, in, mine was in America and Daniel's was in North Africa. But I actually did use fashion magazines from the period. So, for, um, for your research? Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Research? I mean, that's, all, that's exclusively what I used. So, um, but, but that's 20th century because fashion magazines didn't really exist till the end of the 19th century. But the, much. the advice you give to a singer is good for a designer as well. I mean, saturating yourself in the world of the opera is a great first step. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can go to the opera, you can rent or you know, borrow DVDs from the library mm -hmm. uh, and see productions and what they've done with them. Exactly. Yeah. And then you can see how you feel about it in relation to the music. Right. Yeah, and if it's of interest, how many of you have actually, you know, have you been to the opera? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say some of you in this room I know. I love that I actually last season I'm part of like the like the student program at the Metropolitan Opera, mm -hmm. and um, I saw last semester I saw um, Don Giovanni and I saw Verdi's um, Macbeth. Mm -hmm. Both were really mind blowing, and I actually have a kind of a background in costume design, which is how I got into fashion because I did like high school work and like community theater working. So, kind of like the opposite way for me. Like, I, like I, I was doing like performing roles, and then I got into costume design, and I was like, oh, I love this, but I like fashion more. So, it was just a different path. But, um, I, I love it, it's such a different, like, like everything's so over the top, and it's so, so much more dynamic. I feel like because I've done like a lot of like musicals, it had a lot of exposure to just theater in general. Um, and it's just like so special and like, really like, precious and rare. And it's not as like mainstream, it's kind of like, underground and really cool. But um, I think sometimes more so than in state in, in theater. A, a design team can really come up with a, a, a whole style mm -hmm. layout f for an opera. And, when, and, and the times it's successful are as rare as hen's teeth, as they say, but whatever that means. Mm. Um, <laughs> but when it works, it's, it is incredibly mind-blowing. And it's also, I feel like watching a performance, like I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have enough exposure to be familiar with a lot of the plot lines, but um, when you're watching it's in a foreign language. I feel like it gives the designer and the director like a little bit more like leeway and freedom with like a design concept because you're not really paying as much attention to the plot, so you can get away with more. Well, and let's wise. face it. I mean, the, the the story being told by the plot is pretty basic. Mm -hmm. You don't really have to pay attention to every word, which is okay, good because really you're supposed to be listening to the music. <laughs> yes. Can I ask three unrelated questions and answer whichever you feel? Um, the first is, who does all of the often elaborate beadwork, uh, embroidery, uh, ruffling, and whatnot that is common in operatic costume, but not necessarily in dramatic theater? Okay. Um, the second question is, what do you do when you have two casts of vastly different size? And the third is a very practical thing of, of, of body odor or sweating, because it's very hot under those lights, and mm. some of those costumes are super heavy and with these wigs and the makeup that people are going to perspire. So what do you do about, and maybe some people wear awful perfume too, I don't know, what do you do about making it ready for the next performance? Well, awesome all questions. Yes. All great questions, Pat. Um, first one is, you know, uh, nowadays the common solution for the odor is to put cheap vodka in an atomizer and saturate the costume with vodka inside out. When the vodka evaporates, it takes the smell with it and it does not leave a residual smell. People used to leave Do we do Yeah. Do we do that at all? Yeah. I yeah. Use it, I use it on upholstery all the time. Yeah. It's um, way cheaper than dry yeah. cleaning. Gordon Ostrowski in Manhattan School of Music said to me, though, and waste all of that vodka. <laughs> 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 Um, for 
grease always leaves a residual smell. Right. I, I find and there's supposed to be some chemicals in yeah, the grease. Yeah, they, they don't know what it's doing. Stick with good old alcohol. We at sort of potato and alcohol, so it's, no. it's much um, Make sure if somebody sweats profusely in a costume, which happens in about five minutes on the opera stage, because it's hard work. Yeah. You've got when they take it off, you've got to turn it completely inside out and make sure it gets completely dry as actually as quickly as possible. Sometimes we put them in front of fans. Uh, it's very expensive to dry clean, so very often uh, the bacteria that causes the odor never completely goes away, even with cleaning. Sometimes. Um, I, some singers I work with, a lot of the, these ones are Russian, but I think other, other nationalities have the same, it's a different kind of superstition. They believe that if the uh, essence of another famous, wonderful singer is in the costume that they wear, that some of that talent is going to rub off on them. So it's a little never, I never heard that one. And then again, you get to the chorus, where if, if you're putting a set of costumes in the chorus room that have been on... 27 tours of Traviata, and these girls get these ball gowns, and they're like, oh, please, are you kidding? You're making me wear this? It smells horrible. Then you take out the vodka, and you just douse it and do the best you can. And you wait till it dries, right? You can't put it, oh, right. can't put it yeah. on wet? Absolutely yeah. not. And the thing of it is, costumes, it's not like, you know, two pieces, you know, a, a knit top with a line, one piece of lining in it. There's the fashion fabric. There's, you know, if there's a boned inner bodice, that's a piece of canvas, and there's the bone casings, and there's a lining for that, and maybe there's another interlining if there's like an underdress or something like that, and you get through all these layers, it's hard to get it dry. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's part of the glamour of this business. Why, why it's not to wear stuff. Yeah. True. There are, there are actually union agreements and statements about perfume and cologne um, um, that frequently members of the chorus union are encouraged not to uh, respect, we call yes, it. Yeah. not to wear like cologne to the theater at all. By your and some people partner. are allergic. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. performers are allergic. I've worked with a soprano who was allergic to citrus fruit and this whole, I mean, this whole list of things and the whole, and, and we couldn't come near the stage. Now that was asking for a lot, but it's, you know, she wouldn't have been able to say anything. Mm -hmm. So we brought an orange nearby. Yeah. Perfumes the same way. And uh, as to your question about sizes, uh, the tradition of costume making is actually custom making clothing for the stage. And when you custom make, you custom make something to a specific size. We dance to a different song with opera costumes because they are investments, these expensive costumes. Some of the costumes in Washington National Opera storage are well over 25 years and they are still working on the stage. Uh, they have to be made alterable. My rule of thumb is within two sizes, two sizes smaller, two sizes larger. Depends on the seam. You can add a lot of seam allowance in the shoulder and in a straight side seam, but not in a curved side back seam. And, you know, a hem that's over three or four inches is, starts to look ridiculous. So you've got to be really careful about that. And if it's two, two singers, it, I mean, if I have a day and the singers are close, we'll make the alterations. But, for instance, we're doing a production, it's not an opera, it's a musical of, of Showboat in May. And we have two different casts, and cast A is on Monday, or, and cast B is on Tuesday, and cast A is again on Wednesday. There's no way those ladies or gentlemen are sharing clothes. We've got to have two sets of clothes. And if, it adds to the budget. If uh, I may uh, interject, when I worked at the Met, we had, they had tours come through the costume shop, and the, um, the tour guides would always say, oh, and through an elaborate system of hooks and eyes, they can make one costume fit anybody. <laughs> well, that wasn't really true. <laughs> but, but they did have the, the center backs of the bodices, the fitted bodices, did have as many as six or eight sets of hooks and eyes that m maybe made as much difference as maybe four to six inches that they could without having, because sometimes on the day of the performance, like uh, the afternoon of the performance, if Lantine Price was scheduled to sing and, and call up sick, and they would have to throw in somebody a completely different size, and there's no time to do a lot of alterations, but they actually could just overlap the center back 
and then maybe do a real quick and dirty, you know, something on the sleeves or whatever. There, there is a benefit when your closest audience member is, is no closer than 20 yeah. feet away across yeah. the orchestra pit. Does alterability affect or inform your concept of the design when you're starting from scratch? I hope not. Mm -mm. That's, my, that's my job. That's not the designer's job. Yeah, it, it, it should. The one thing also, when you've got costumes, you have two people playing the same part. Frequently, when you end up with different body types, you have to adjust the design mm -hmm. between one okay. cast and the other. Mm -hmm. And I did a Don Pasquale at Seattle Opera about 10 years or so, and the lead female was Carolyn Blackwell, who's small and cute and gorgeous and adorable. And of course, we designed for her, and her double I was like, oh, okay, she's a little bit taller and a little bit larger, but I think the designs for Harrelin will work okay. Well, unfortunately, the second cast woman showed up to the first rehearsal, and she was about 40 pounds heavier than the measurements and the photos that had been sent to us in advance. So I had to take those designs that were designed for cute, wee little pixie Harrelin Blackwell and put vertical stripes down you know, and um, make the leg of the sleeve smaller and the whole scale of things had to be tweaked because of this change in shape that got handed to us rather like surprise. But you know what, it's, it's wonderful to hear you say that, Daniel, because there are so many people, um, and I see this happen frequently with young designers who just, they, they've come up with their design and they, they stay with that idea and we, you know, this was something that Leon kept talking to them about endlessly is that, you know, we're double cast, they are two girls of completely disparate shape and size and they both have to be beautiful because they're the ingenue. They ha we have to fall in love with them as much as the tenor does or baritone, depending on which show it is. And, it, and putting them into coloring wise the same dress that is a particular shade of buttercup that is about as unflattering to the hair color and the skin tone of one girl. And it can sometimes even be the color and not just the shape. Um, and the, you know, if, you f if the designer comes back and says, okay, to really make this work, it has to be two completely different dresses because they are two completely different girls then, you know, we in the administration have to be willing to say, okay, we have to figure out how to make that work. The chorus will be naked. Um, or whatever the solution is. <laughs> no one ever wants that. That's the person with the can of red dye comes in. Circle gets the square. Oh, that was the last question that you had, Pat. You were asking about who does the beating, the beater? A lot of the times, it's not what you think it is because there are lots of tricks where you can buy something, you can buy a fabric and cut it up and it looks like beading, but it's not. And really clever designers sometimes, uh, you, you have no idea what the stuff's made out of. It. It's, it's, uh, it's some kind of wonderful, mysterious thing <laughs> that looks elaborate. And, it, and if you were to see it up close, you might be kind of shocked. Sometimes it's puffing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, who is the shop manager for the New York University um, Tisch School of the Arts, where I got uh, my degree, and she used to describe the work of Desmond Keeley, very famous designer, yep. and she would say that... He's the master. Um, he was the master of doing what David's talking about, mm -hmm. that up close it would look like some sort of mud that had been applied by a trowel. And from the stage, it would look like a detail, that, these are Maggie's words, a detail that had been kissed together by wood sprite. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. He's, Desmond is actually the person I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. He, he just had a knack. He worked the same way a painter attacks a canvas. So it wasn't he didn't work like a dressmaker. It wasn't about, you know, size something or other caviar beads or anything. He could make these sort of collages and he knew enough about how the light was going to affect the textures and everything and, and could get these incredibly rich effects with just cheesy old fabric that you, you'd be amazed. If, you know, if it had the right amount of glitter and stuff in it, I mean, if you saw it in the store, you'd go, ooh. 
I mean, you, you wouldn't want to pay 98 cents a yard for it, but somehow he could combine all these things in, in this kind of collage technique, mm -hmm. and he was a master at it. His, his Traviata set is world famous, and I can't believe that it's still out and about and being performed on, because uh, he designed the scenery as well as the costumes for this set. And the, the story that lives in lore and legend in stage management world is we call it the Bring Your Own Spoon set. He had these, uh, they are three-dimensional on the front, but they are in fact two-dimensional on the back chandeliers that appear in the second and the third, or, sorry, in the first and the third act. And to look at them in the way that they were initially designed, you thought they were made out of all of these glorious Austrian crystals until you get right up on the stage and realize that it is in fact all clear plastic spoons that are all hung from the spoon handle or from the spoon bowl and the handle sticks down. And it was one of those that he originally designed it and had the idea of being able to do it with these Austrian crystals, which amounted to more than the Lyric Opera of Chicago's entire season budget. And he wrote back and went, oh, well then we'll come up with a better solution. And this box of spoons arrived at the scene shop the next day. And to this day, that set travels with a box of spoons for replacements if the chandeliers show up and need to replace. Like, there, there's these weird pieces of fur that hang from these giant drapes that have three plastic spoons glued to them. And you look at it, and, you're, and then you stand out in the house, and it looks like the most awesome velvet drape with tassels. Um, we could clearly tell opera stories for the entire rest of the night, but I'm sure these people would love to have a little glass of wine and talk with all of you in person. Thank you, everyone, for a lovely discussion about the world of costumes.